So we're in the book of Daniel, and we've been uh, looking at the sixth chapter. I think we broached that last week. We started to get into that. Uh, <clears throat> at this point in Daniel's life, he is an oxygenarian. He's well over 80 years old. He's already been uh, serving. He served in Babylon for a number of years, and then he's serving in the Medo-Persian Empire as an administrator there. He was a gifted young man, so faithful to the Lord, even from childhood. And it's wonderful when you have walked with the Lord as a child. That's our prayer for all of the children here at the chapel, that they would never know a day that they haven't walked with the Lord. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It's such a blessing to be growing up in the I don't know what that's like. I came to the Lord late in life. Uh, I can only imagine the difference it would have made in my life. Mm. But for those that do, it's wonderful. Mm. And Daniel was that sort, growing up in the Lord. In chapter 6 of Daniel, in verse 1, it says that it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole realm. Now, I shared with you before the principal leader, the most renowned, renowned leader in Persia or the Medo-Persian Empire was who? Cyrus. Cyrus. Cyrus the king. Now, Cyrus was king over the entire Persian Empire. When he, he established or appointed Darius to be the leader over Babylon. Remember, we looked at that last week, where later on in the text it says that Darius was appointed, chosen. Now, Darius, in turn, chose 123 leaders or administrators to administer in the kingdom of Babylon for him. There were three principal governors, one of which was Daniel. And then under each of them were 40 satraps or administrators, like regional governors, mayors, whatever you would like to call them. And they would report back to the governor, the three governors would report back to Darius. Darius was so impressed by this captive from Judah. And that's how the, some, some would refer to that Daniel. You know, that Daniel, that captive from Judah. Now, why would they say it that way? It was a slur. It was anti-Semitic. When did anti-Semitism begin? Back in Egypt. Aren't we glad it's dead now? Don't we wish? We can only wish that away. It will. It's going to die, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But nonetheless, Daniel had so impressed Darius, the king in Babylon, with his integrity. What do you think their main function was as administrators administering on behalf of the king in all of these different regions within Babylon? Taxes. Hmm. Get the penienza, right? <laughs> now, what happens when you have a lot of tax collectors and you have primary responsibility for collecting the tax and there's no one looking over your shoulder? They cheat, right? They <laughs> and, and I think Daniel was of the sort you could never, you could never buy Daniel. No, no, no. No money, no position, no possession could ever steal his heart away from God and him conducting himself honorably before the God whom he serves. He never saw himself, himself as serving man. He always saw himself as serving God. Is that the way you see your life and your service, your stewardship, whether it's with your employer or maybe your employees, if you are an employer? Do you see that stewardship in your relationship with your husband, with your wife? Do you see that stewardship in relationship to your children, in the relationship with the community that you have, your neighbors? I mean, we have to be very, very careful that we allow God to exercise his loving authority in our life in every single sphere of our life. Now, Darius saw such an excellent spirit that abided in this aging statesman, over 80 years old that he was going to set him over the entire realm. And he would be second only unto Darius, as he was under Nebuchadnezzar. And how did the other 20, 121 feel about that? Or 23 feel about that, I guess. 22, 22, 122. They were jealous. They were envious, right? And where does that jealousy come from, that envious? Yeah. Sunday, I think we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 
And Paul makes very clear that where that strife, envy, division, jealousy comes from is every evil thing, but it's carnality. They're acting carnal. Do you know a Christian can act carnal even though they're saved, they're born again? Is that true? How many of you have done that? You ever act carnal and you're saved? Oh, now you're all lying. <laughs> but we want to keep that to a minimum, don't we? Yeah. Now, Daniel was of that sort. They were jealous of Daniel. Now they're going to try to entrap him. They're trying to bring something against him in his failure to exercise his administrative details the way he should. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give an account to them so the king would suffer no loss. No loss in his taxation is what we're talking about, really. And so Daniel was one of the three. But this Daniel, not that Daniel, when he's referred to negatively, and it's an anti cinematic slur, it's a that Daniel. But this Daniel, this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So Daniel didn't have to work very hard to be the man he was, did he? All he had to do was yield to the Spirit. Surrender to the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God gives you the ability to be Christ-like. I don't have that within me. It's not innate within me. Being, living the Christian life is allowing Jesus Christ through the person of his Holy Spirit to live his life through me. Is that not true? And, and as I read the scriptures and understand God's will for my life, I realize how some of my desires or longings may not be appropriate. They may not be what God has for me. And what do I need to do with those desires? The only reason why you're tempted, beloved, is because the desire still exists. If you allow the Holy Spirit to eliminate the desire, what happens to the temptation? It doesn't exist any longer, right? Right? And so that's, that's the, really the key, is to understand who you are. Allow the Bible to read you, so that God can bring out what it is that you need to change about your character, your desires, your longings, your wants, so that they line up with his will. And then as you pray and, allow, and ask the Holy Spirit, and you offer that to him, he never takes anything from you, does he? But he offers what you, he receives what you offer, right? That's why we've never taken a collection, never taken an offering, and all the years we've been operating. Why? Because God never takes anything from you. He'll receive what you offer him. And what we should offer him more than anything else is a heart. And if he gets your heart, what else does he get? Everything. Daniel's heart belonged to Jehovah, to the God of his fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, without reservation. And therefore, he never had any inappropriate desire he had to fight or struggle with. And from childhood, you listening, Leonardo? From childhood, he would give to the Lord those desires that weren't right, that weren't in the will of God. And he had godly parents that would instruct him to inform his conscience, right? The conscience is a wonderful mechanism. But it has to be informed. We know a basic right and wrong when we're brought into this world. Every man does, don't they? But what the Bible does is it accurately informs my conscience to the will of God as opposed to my will. How God would have me act, think, desire, talk, as opposed to how I would want to. And therefore, as I surrender that, my life changes. I become a man whom others would recognize or a woman whose others would recognize. There is a different spirit about you. That should be the comment that's made, especially by unbelievers, with regard to you and to me. Something different about that person. And then they have to look very hard to find accusations against us for wrongdoing. Elders and deacons in the church, they must be blameless. Perfect? Perfect? No. God's never, listen to me, God's never looking for perfection in your performance. His performance is perfect. He's looking for perfection in your love and obedience to him. You surrender to him. And then he works out all these things. But to be blameless means you can be accused. But what? Never found guilty. Now, people can accuse you of lots of things. Isn't it absolutely appalling, the accusations that are being made against the former president? 
during this demonic, uh, uh, democratic convention? I mean, how blatantly they lie, knowing, knowing it's already been fact-checked, knowing so much of what they share is absolutely untrue. But in a lot, so many of those matters, Donald Trump is blameless. Accused, 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 but not found guilty. Well, that should be our life. And the only way they could find Daniel guilty of anything would be in his obedience to his God. Isn't that amazing? Look at the text. So the governors, the satraps, sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could not find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. He was such an obstacle to their compromise, to their appeasement. They could not be comfortable in their little indiscretions with Daniel around. Hmm. I'll bet he never got invited to any of their parties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Behave, Pastor Britt. Okay, I will. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> then these men said, We shall find we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Yeah. This Daniel. That Daniel. Hmm. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever, O king. Now, they're, they're, they're going to they're gonna attempt to get Darius to proclaim a decree to basically make him God. That no man or woman could petition any god or gods for 30 days except Darius. Set him up as being God, Right? Live forever, O king, and all the governors of the kingdom and the administrators and the satraps, the counselors, the advisors have counseled together and established a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Wow. How flattering. All the governors, all the satraps? How many were there in total? There was 123 in total. Of the three governors, Daniel was one. The satraps. Could you think of anybody that might have been a satrap that might not have gone along with this decree besides Daniel? She, Mishael, Hanan, and Azariah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You might know them by. But Mishael, Hanan, and Azariah. Now, like chapter 3, remember when the three Hebrew boys were demanded to bow down and worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar had established in the plain, and they refused, and he said they were going to throw you into the fiery furnace, and they weren't concerned about what was going to happen. They trusted God completely, whether they, God's going to deliver us out of your hand, O king, whether in the fire, through the fire, makes any difference to us, and we're not careful how we answer you. It's God before the government, right? Now, I pointed out in chapter 3, who was missing from that whole scene? Daniel. Now we come to chapter 6, and who's missing from this scene? Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah. Where are they? I'm sure that they didn't go along with it. I'm sure they didn't agree, but they're making the king believe in their hyperbole that everyone, we consulted everyone, all of us have come together, all of us agree. Hmm? Not hardly. Now, you ought to have thought the king would have used some discernment at this point and asked the question, Where's Daniel? He's about to make Daniel second in the kingdom. The only one who would have authority above him would be him himself. So you, you would have thought he would have at least consulted Daniel, right? No, not so. Mm. He was so filled with himself at this point, and they were so puffing him up with pride and flattering him that he, couldn't, he could not reason the situation out. Now, O king, verse 8, establish the decree, sign it in writing, so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed and had written the decree. Irrevocable, right? The difference between uh, when Daniel describes the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has of these world-governing empires 
And it's amazing how accurate he has been. There's been a lot of criticism about the book of Daniel being written after the... No, 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 no. And by the way, Jesus quotes from Daniel. He quotes from the first part of Daniel. He quotes from the second part of Daniel. So there wasn't two Daniels. There was only one. And Jesus would say, as, Daniel, as the prophet Daniel has stated, right? Giving him credit for authorship. But when Daniel is interpreting the dream of those world-governing empires, it would be one of gold, of silver, brass, or bronze, iron, partly iron, partly clay. We know what those kingdoms were, right? The world-governing empires. What were they? The first one, the head of gold? Babylon, the Babylonian. The second one, the head of silver? The that was the Medo-Persian, and then the Grecian, the Roman, the revived the Roman Empire. Verse 4 are gone, have come and gone. The fifth one is, is forming now, in our day, amazingly. And we know that the scriptures declare for us that there's going to come a one-world governmental system of which one man will rule, a one-world economic system of which that same man will rule. A one world health system, the world health organization of which that one man will rule. And then there'll be a one world religious system of which the false prophet will rule. All of this is coming together now. You see that, don't you? Yeah. Amazing. Just as Daniel prophesied. Now, the head of gold was Nebuchadnezzar. Why? Why was he the head of gold? His law, his word was law. Whatever he said, he, he could contradict a law today that he decreed yesterday. And it would have to change the law. But with the Medes and the Persians, the king was subject to the law of the Medes and Persians. That, it's supposed to be that our leaders are subject to our Constitution and Bill of Rights. That's changed, hasn't it? Sadly enough. Hmm. They accuse the side that's trying to preserve our democracy as destroying and being a threat to the democracy when just the opposite is true. So they get the king to weaponize the legal system. What do they call that? Lawfare? Is that what that's called today? Lawfare? What's new? They're using lawfare against Daniel. And they're going to weaponize the justice system against him. Hmm. Their political rival. Hmm. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home in his upper room and with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times a day, morning, afternoon, and evening, and he prayed. And what's the first thing he prayed? Yeah. Jesus, it's recorded for us, on that last Seder, that last Passover meal that Jesus had with his disciples, he instituted what we call communion. And he took the bread and he, you could have stayed, gave thanks. That's the, that's the Greek word, eucharisteo. It's where we get the word Eucharist, right? And he took the cup, and he eucharisteo, he gave thanks. When we pray, the first thing we should do every time we pray is, first of all, thank God for all that he has done for us, that he has given us, but more importantly, for all that he is. That was Daniel's practice. And it tells us that Daniel prayed three times a day To his God, as was, this is the end of verse 10, as was his custom since, since, what's it say? Early. Early days. Leo, you pray three times a day? How many times a day do you pray? Uh, four. Oh, four. Oh, my, you're better than a Daniel. Now, now, the reason why I have to keep pointing out this, Leo came to me a few months ago and he said, Pastor Ritt, I don't know if you know, but you need to know, I'm going to be a pastor. I said, okay, then you're, you're a pastor in training here. and We're going to train you up. But four times a day? That's wonderful, Leo. Don't ever give up praying to God every single day, multiple times a day, right? We can do it three times a day when we, when we eat. You eat three times a day? I try not to, but... <laughs> This was a practice of this man since he was a child. Now he's well in his 80s. This is a man whose life is going to demonstrate what Paul admonishes us to, that we should finish well. As, you, as, you, as we're approaching, you know, you love the seasons? One, one thing I, I love about South Carolina is that we have a long fall, a very short winter compared to what 
I'm used to in upstate New York, and a very short spring and a long summer, right? Now, up in New York, we don't have much of a summer. We have a short spring and a long winter, a <laughs> short fall. <laughs> Where I come from, the average snowfall every year is 110 inches. That's a lot of snow. And it gets so cold when you walk out in the snow, it squeaks. You ever, you ever hear snow squeak? <laughs> but the seasons, when did the seasons begin? When? After the flood. After the flood, that's when the seasons began. That's when we'd have all of the changes in seasons, the violent weather, the cold air, warm air, etc., etc. What were the seasons meant to demonstrate for us? Our life. Our life. Who here is under 20 years old? Leo? You're under 20? I think you are. Yeah, yeah, okay. You're the only one right now that's in springtime. Here. Springtime is 0 to 20. Who's in summer? 21 to 40. Any summer? Yeah, the summer guy. Summer guy, yeah. Summer's a beautiful time, isn't it? Yeah. Zero to 40, or, or excuse me, 21 to 40 is summer. 41 to 60, what is that? Fall, autumn. Isn't autumn a beautiful time? I, I know my favorite time of year is autumn. You like autumn? Yeah. How many of you in autumn? Nice, nice. Enjoy it. Doesn't last long. <laughs> From 61 to, well, only God knows. What is that? Winter. How many in winter? I, I, you know, I love this winter of my life. What did you say? You can feel the aches from the winter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? POD, pain of the day, every day. When you wake up, you got a POD. <laughs> but winter. And winter prepares us for the eternal spring. Yeah. You see, if you get stronger and healthier and faster and smarter, you'd never want to leave this place. But as we age and our body starts to fail us and other things, you know, you look forward to that eternal spring that we're going to enter into that will never end. Isn't it right, Nathan, that if you hang around here long enough, you're going to go out the same way you came in? And how might that be? Bald, toothless, and in diapers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so where am I going with all of this? The seasons, we're talking about seasons. And he, as he is approaching this winter of his life, he is more committed, more faithful, more devout than he has ever been. Isn't that wonderful? Paul encourages us that we need to finish well. Don't ever give up. Don't ever rest in your laurels. Don't ever rest in the past. You've got to do more for God towards the end than you ever did in the beginning. When you see the finish line, what are you supposed to do? Sprint. Sprint. Let it kick in there with everything you've got. Mm. Somebody said, Pastor, what are you going to do when you retire? Same thing I'm doing now. Teach the Bible. Share the Bible. Share the word with everybody I can. You know? That's our, that's our mission. That's our purpose. That's our calling. And that was Daniel. Since the time he was young, since he was a child, that was his manner of life. Verse 11. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. No kidding. Now what, the, what are they going to accuse him of? Praying. Have you been paying attention to what's going on in London? Unbelievable. Canada, London, most of Europe, the culture's gone. I mean, it's, it's lost. The Judeo-Christian culture that began in Europe. So many wonderful preachers that we can think of and Bible commentators and, and just wonderful scholarly men that have come out of England. Dead spiritually. Canada, our neighbor to the dead. We're, we're, listen, where England is, where Canada is, where Europe, that's where we're going. Make no mistake about them, but don't be in distress. Is he not still in control? 
the overarching theme of the entire book of Daniel is what? God's sovereignty. That God is sovereign over everything, over, over kings, pagan as they might be, over nations, over his own people, that God is sovereign over every situation. As Daniel and I and, and Nathan were talking last night, God is sovereign. Now, why has God allowed that to take place? Well, that, that's what you try to discover. You know, when difficult things come into our life, God has a purpose for them. Never to harm us, never to destroy us, never to hurt us, but to mature and perfect us, to grow us. And it's through those difficult seasons of life that we mature and grow. Anybody can go through the good times together, can't they? Yeah. Yeah. Until they didn't have any more use for China Joe, right? <laughs> but well, they escorted him off stage as quickly as they could, didn't they? <laughs> and he's not going to return. Yeah. No, we don't want that kind of friend. So these men assembled, they found Daniel praying and making supplication to his God. And they went before the king and they spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any God or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? And the king answered and said, yep, 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 I did. Yep, it's true. According to the law of the Medes and the Persians, what does not alter? Yep, yep, I did. Now, he, he's, at this point, he still hasn't caught on. The entrapment, Right? And make no mistake about it, he loves Daniel. He doesn't want to do what he has to do by law. Mm -hmm. So they answered and said before the king, that Daniel, who was one of the captives from Judah, you know, that Jew, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you had signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Now, you, you, very soon, we're going to all have to ask ourselves, who are we going to honor and obey, God or the government? We, it's easy to answer that question right here, assembled in the sanctuary. If the FBI was knocking on the door, confiscating all of your electronics to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt you're a domestic terrorist, and how do they determine domestic terrorists today? First of all, you're... Pro-life. Pro-life. Secondly, you're anti-alphabet people. <laughs> you know the alphabet people? LGBTQ. <laughs> Thirdly, God bless you, you're a Christian. Fourthly, you support Israel. You're, you're a Zionist. Are you Zionist Christians? Yes. What does it mean to be a Zionist Christian? God gave them the right to the land. From the Mediterranean to the Euphrates. They only possess 10% of what God gave them. In the millennium, they're going to have it all. They're going to take possession 100% of what God had decreed. But we are Zionist Christians because we believe God gave them the right to the land. He decreed it, right? All of that, coupled together, makes you a domestic terrorist in the eyes of our government. If they cause you, demand you, recant and turn from Jesus, and deny him, or be thrown in jail. What are you going to do? Now, listen, you, you need, that's, a, that's a question we should consider, because it's getting that crazy out there. And the local law enforcement in our area know that Pastor Darren and Christy are very, very active and leaders in the pro-life movement. It, you don't have to come to many services or listen to about a handful of messages to know how pro-Zionist, pro-Israel we are. And we would never, ever, ever perform a same-sex marriage, nor would I ever attend one, because marriage is a sacred institution, a sacrament that God has established. But all of that makes me an enemy, and you, of the state. Do you understand that? Now, all of a sudden, Daniel wakes up, he's an enemy of the state because he's violated a decree, an ungodly, unrighteous decree. And now they bring it to the king's attention. And so they answered and said before the king, that Daniel, that one of the captives of Judah, does not show regard to you, O king, for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these things, was greatly displeased with himself, and he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. He said, oh, what kind of an idiot can I be? You ever think, say that to yourself? Never? 
I, I hate to recall how many times I've said that to myself. You idiot. <laughs> how could you choose mint chocolate chip ice cream? <laughs> it's an abomination. <laughs> My wife loves it. I can't stand it. No, but there are many times, and, and here, the king finally wakes up to what's happened, what's taken place. He's been played the fool. He was greatly displeased with himself, and not only himself. How did he feel about those men that did this to him? Oh, yeah, we'll find out in a minute. And he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. There's got to be a way. There's got to be a way. Bring all of my lawyers. Get my legal team in here now. We need to find a way. Look, look, look at the extent that they went to to try to prosecute our former president. Unbelievable. Grasping at straws. Uh, but, he, but here the king was doing just the opposite to try to save a friend, not to condemn a friend. The last thing he wanted to do was to cast Daniel in that den of lions. Hmm. Make no mistake about it. Who is the true king? Jesus. And listen to me. We are entering the den of lions in this world, in this culture, at this time. If you understand eschatology and you understand Bible prophecy, we are entering into the lion's den. Now the king will be with us. Just as Daniel was fearless and said, my God will deliver me one way or another. And so should you. You have to be fearless. Because we're going to be experiencing the lion. We're going to be experiencing the fire that they cast those three Hebrew boys in. Make no mistake about it. The rest of the world, as someone said to me, Pastor Ritt, I am just so sorry for all that you have to put up with sometimes. I said, put up with? Nobody's cut my tongue out of my mouth. Nobody's burned my house down, my church. His church. You know, it's happening in the rest. Listen, the, the, the violence against the church is so extreme today in other parts of the world. You and I are oblivious to it. Now, John Michael is going to make you very painfully aware once again, because he's our persecuted church representative, right? Not that he's been persecuted, but, <laughs> but, but God has given John Michael such a heart. And he's given so many of us, and he's given me such a heart for the persecuted church, for our persecuted brethren. It's the persecution of the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, not Christendom, not, not the apostate church, but the true church that is being persecuted now as like never before. More Christians were killed in the last century than the previous centuries combined. Did you know that? More Christians murdered in the last century than all of the previous centuries. Unbelievable. And, and, and it's... it's the violence against the church now is, is, in fact, worse. The acts of violence that are being committed against churches in the United States has risen, is it 800%, John Michael? Oh, I'm sorry. Are you paying attention? You need to sit up front. <laughs> My question. Acts of violence against the church in America. 800 acts of violence, was it? Or was it 800% rise? You remember? You quoted a statistic two weeks ago. You don't remember? You expect me to remember? <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. These... these it's okay. Why? Why is it okay? Because God's in control and we share in his suffering. Romans 8, what does it say? We are, like, we are like lambs being led to the slaughter daily. Daily. If they persecuted him, if they maligned him, if they mocked him, if they scorned him, then what would we expect that they would do to us? But then we can be absolutely confident in that all things work together for good. For those who love God are called according to his purposes. 
What happened to the early reformers will be child's play in comparison to what's going to be happening in the future. Because my Bible tells me that. I read it, and I believe it. Hmm? That they will overcome. And how do we overcome? By the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, and we did not love our life to the end. It means that we weren't trying to preserve our life here at all costs, but for living for Jesus no matter what the cost. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, that was Daniel. Yes, it was. So the king tried to deliver Daniel, verse 3. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. When are you going to put this man in jail? When are you going to throw him into the lion's den? <laughs> and so the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Didn't he know about executive order? Hmm? Executive fiat? I mean, he just, you know, just write an executive order. <laughs> That's what they do today when they go around the government, right? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What was the decree? that nobody for 30 days could petition any other God, any person other than, and what did he just do? He's petitioning God. <laughs> God's got such a wonderful sense of humor, doesn't he? <laughs> Here he's got the king petitioning him to deliver Daniel <laughs> from his decree that he established that they can only petition him. <laughs> I find this hilarious. And so the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of the lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, your God, your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. And then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the lions of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, with the signets of the lords. Hmm. You know, the, the other two governors, they put their signet ring on there. It's not, not getting away. That the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. They wanted him to be cat food. Right? Yeah. But God had another plan. Isn't it wonderful when God intervenes miraculously? Yeah. I haven't seen that video that you sent out yet. I'm looking forward to viewing that. About all these miracles and signs and wonders that God's doing among the Jews right now. Speak loud. Praise God. Yeah, yeah, view it and then uh, have Darren distribute it out to the body. Verse 16. So the king gave the command. They brought Daniel, cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God. Do you think he knew about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they got thrown into the fiery furnace? Well, I'm sure he did. And what a, what a tremendous testimony Daniel must have had. Who, all, all, who knows but God? All of the miraculous things that God must have done on this man's behalf. And for this king to recognize him. When it was the very king that overthrew the Babylonian kingdom of which he was second in. He should have been executed. But they didn't execute him. His life was preserved. Now the king went to his palace, verse 18, and he spent the night fasting. And no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. Mm. You, you like the story of Esther, Queen Esther? Mm. You remember the night that Xerxes' sleep went from him? And so because he couldn't sleep, what did he do? Yep, he was read of the chronicles of the history of the Persian kingdom. And it came to light that he just so happened to be listening to the librarian share on the historical event of his preservation from the men who were plotting his death. And who had revealed all of this so the king could be preserved? Mordecai. Just what a coincidence of all of the volumes of material that the librarian could have been reading from just so happens preparing Artaxerxes 
for everything that was going to transpire the next day. You know that story. God, listen, God is faithful always and forever. It may be at the 11th hour he steps in, but he will be faithful, beloved. And our life is found in him. And according to the Apostle Paul, we're not here anymore. Where are we? We're there, seated in heavenly places at the right hand of God the Father. It's already been accomplished. Whom he justified, he glorified. Skips the whole sanctification pressure, the whole struggle that we have in this life. Absolutely certain of it. He is faithful even when you are. He, he cannot deny himself. You understand that, don't you? Hmm? And when the king arose very early in the morning and he went in haste to the den of lions and when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. Now, how do you think he cried out? I, 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 there was no way in the world he expected Daniel to be alive. He was crying. He was sobbing. He was so ashamed of himself. What have I done? What have I done? What have I done? Daniel, what have I done? I'm so sorry. Can you imagine causing the death of one of your closest friends? How grieved you would be? How angst? You'd be out of your mind with grief. Now, that, that's how he approached the dead. Understand that. This lamenting in the Hebrew, just, it, our English translation doesn't do it justice. He was, he was out of his mind with grief and sorrow and repentance over causing the death of this man that he loved so much and he respected. And that's what he believed. The king rose very early in the morning and he went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The Lord, the king spoke saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Now, I don't think he believed it for one moment. Do you? No. You believe you're going to be what? You're going to jump off this earth. Is that what you tell me? That, that suddenly one day, at a moment in time, in the twinkling of an eye, you're going to go from mortal to immortality. You're going to go from being here to being there? Do you really believe that? With all my heart. All my heart. One day, beloved, we're going to reach the vanishing point. Like Enoch. Enoch walked with God so closely and surrendered in obedience to his will, and one day he walked so close to God that he was no more. I'm looking forward to that day, aren't you? Hallelujah. Mm. <coughs> yes, the God whom you serve continually has been able to deliver you from the lions. Mm. Then Daniel said to the king, O oh, king, live forever, O oh, king. Who said that previously? Yeah. Did they mean it? No. Hypocrites. Be careful when people flatter you. My God has sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 4 that, that, that God shut the mouth of the lions that were after him. 1 Peter tells us that Satan goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may. Do we have anything to fear of Satan? Absolutely nothing. Do you have anything to fear of demons? Demonic powers, the occult? Absolutely not. If you're in obedience to God's will in your life and you're surrendered as much as you are able, I'm not saying you're perfect. I'm not, I'll never say that your performance is perfect. I'm saying that your love relationship, that's what he's talking about. Not a perfection of performance, a perfection of relationship that you really do love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do you love Jesus more than your spouse? Do you love Jesus more than your kids? More than your grandkids? More than your pastor? <laughs> of course you do. If you love Jesus more than anything else in this world, you're rapture ready. You have nothing to fear whatsoever. Satan materialized himself in a man's room one night. It's all recorded for us. Do you know who that was? Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation. Not, not Martin Luther, the father of the... Uh, uh, civil rights movement, but Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, he was in his study you know, and he wanted, he wanted to interpret the Latin Bible into the common language so that everybody could enjoy the word of God. Right? But as he's in his study working away, he feels a presence 
haunting presence in his room. And he looks over, and there's Satan manifest, all alone, in the dark, working under a candle lamp, and there's Satan. Now, how do you think Satan had appeared? As what? As an angel? No, I don't think. No, 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 no. He appears as an angel of light when he's deceiving you or seducing you. He wanted to put fear in him. He wanted to frighten him. He wanted to terrorize him. So he would appear in all of his hideous ugliness. Think, think of Stephen King's demented imagination going wild and multiply it several times. And that was the presence in his room that night. And you know what his reaction was? Oh, it's only you. And he took his inkwell and threw it at him. <laughs> and the stain was still on the wall for, for years. That's how, listen, that's how confident he was and how closely he walked with the Lord and in the Lord. Now listen, that, that's where God wants every one of us, beloved. I want to be there. Don't you want to be there? I want to be so confident in my relationship with the Lord that Satan himself can't put fear in me. Wow. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Mm. Yes, my God whom I serve has shut the lion's mouths. My God sent his angel, shut the mouth of the lions, and so they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. Before who? Before God. Now listen, here, I'm going to tell you this again. Don't worry about what people say about you. People say so many flattering things about me. <laughs> I, I, I never worry about what people say. I worry about what God knows. If more people worried about what God knew, there'd be a lot of changed people, a lot of transformed lives. But they're more concerned about what people think of them rather than what God knows of them. Isn't that true? Don't ever fall victim to that trap, right? Daniel knew exactly who he was before God. He knew who he was in Christ Jesus. You need to know who you are in Christ Jesus. Your identity is in Christ, period, right? Not in anything else. I've been innocent before him, before my God. Not that he was perfect, but anything, any, any he would just repent, confess it, Move on. If you will but confess your sins, he is faithful and to forgive you of your sins. And then what does he do? He cleanses you from all iniquity. He takes away the desire. He takes away that you don't have any temptation any longer. You're free. Now, I don't know about you. I got saved late in life. And I was a drinker. And I was a smoker. And I was a druggie. And I was a lot of things I shouldn't have been. I was a thief, a fornicator, an adulterer. I was... I, why in the world? I, I told you before, he reached down into a septic tank. He went as far down as he could. He pulled this thing out. He said, look at this. And he said, Jesus is the Father. He says, Jesus, look at this. We're going we're gonna to put your spirit on this. Glorify myself. That this was me. And it all just fell away. The mouth, the smoking, the drinking, Fighting, you know, just, it's, it wasn't my effort. It was just focusing on him and his goodness and his mercy and his grace. And my life began to be transformed more and more and more into the love and light and life of Christ. How many can get testimony? How many can get testimony? It's amazing what he does. Isn't it? Yeah. Wonderful. Hmm. No, I've never done anything against you, God. O king, I have done no wrong before you. Verse 22 at the end. Verse 23 now. And then the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. And so Daniel was taken up out of the den. No injury whatsoever was found in him because he believed in his God. What did I say? Where are we now? In the lion's den. You know what's going to happen very soon? We're going to be taken out. Taken up. And no harm. 
No harm will be found. Now, I'm not saying you couldn't be physically harmed, but no harm is going to come to you emotionally. No harm is going to come to you spiritually. No harm that God doesn't allow for your maturity, for your perfection. But we're in the lion's den now. We're in that fiery furnace now. But he's here in the midst with us. Beloved, it's a very, very small remnant. How many people were in the Medo-Persian kingdom? We have no idea. Millions. Millions. And how many Daniels were there? One. How many people in the pre diluvian world? Before the flood? Somewhere around three million. No. Three billion. Three billion. And how many were saved? Eight. The Bible calls that a few. You know, when the Bible talks about it, he said, and a few were saved, a few were the eight. All the apostles were martyred, save one. One. Beloved, it's always just a remnant. Never been anything more than a remnant. Sunday we talked about the 2080 rule, right? 20% of the church provides 80% of the budget. No, we didn't even get to that part. That's only 2%. <laughs> but 20% of the church provides 80% of the budget. And I shared with you on Sunday, that if, 80%, if that 80% left, it would have no effect on our bottom line. If the 20% that provides the 80% left, what would we have to do? Lock the doors. Put a for sale sign up. Remnant. Remnant. We're talking about obedience. We're talking about surrender. The tithe. Is it, is it, now we don't take an offering, and I told you that. And some people criticize me because they said, oh, he doesn't take an offering, but in order to come to his annual meeting, you have to give some, well, of course you got to invest, right? You got you to be, and it's minimal. What did I say it was? How much a week? $15 this past year. It's going to be $20 next year, a week. That's all. That's all. Minimal. But let me ask you a question. The tithe, is that optional or mandatory? Baptism, optional or mandatory? It's a command. God commands you to be baptized, right? He commands you to tithe, right? But what percentage of Christendom tithes? 2%. Those are the Daniels and the Daniels. <laughs> you want to be a Daniel and a Daniel? Just be obedient. Now, isn't it interesting that God uses that money to test your heart and your fidelity? He does that in the Old Testament. He does it in the New Testament. Why? Because the love of money is the root of all evil. All evil. So, beloved, listen to me. Listen to me. We're in the lion's den, but there ain't many going to be taken out with us. I just want you to know that. Even here in our little chapel family, when we gather together on Sunday morning and the room is full, it's a 2080 rule. 80% are going to have to pick things up after the Sunday after the rapture to cover our costs. <laughs> They're going to have to pay the light bill. And <laughs> now, wouldn't it be better if you alter and adjust your life now? Because that would be, wouldn't want to be, a, if I'm right, and I hope I'm not, I really do, I hope I'm not, but I don't think I am. But if the rapture would occur before this coming Sunday morning, and it's true that, well, let's say the 20% go. Well, let's say maybe it's not even 20, maybe it's just the 2%. How are the 98% or the 80% going to react when they come to church and the, and the remnant's gone? And, and they realize what the common denominator was among those who are missing. They're going to lose their mind. Now we're talking about great fear. Now we're talking about a terror. Because the last thing you want to do is to be left behind. Right now, there is a, you know, you know when, uh, when my son started driving, I wanted to put a governor on his engine. What's a governor, Nick? Yeah, yeah. So it's not, it prevents the engine from going too fast, right? It is a governor. Well, the Holy Spirit working through the church is the governor right now suppressing evil. We can't even imagine. You, you see how evil things are getting, right? 
You can't even imagine the extent to which evil will be manifest when the body of Christ is gone. And the work of the Holy Spirit through the body of Christ is no longer here, present. Now, the Holy Spirit's not going anywhere, is he? No. Why? Because he's God. God is omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient. I mean, you know, the Holy Spirit is God, carries all the attributes of God. There's nothing that exists where he is not. Whether you make your bed in hell, you go up in heaven, you make your bets in the depths of the sea, Psalm 139, you can't get away from the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's not going anywhere. But the, the church that is indwelt by the Holy Spirit and the influence of the church in the world, that's what's disappearing. No more restraint upon evil. Evil will be exercised at a supernatural rate, manifestation, power. <sighs> Frightening. I, I don't want to be here, and I don't want anyone in my love to be here. That, now listen, that's the only reason why I keep sharing this stuff and warning you. Is that not reasonable? Jesus warned the Laodicean church, right? That's the last day's church, the Laodicean church, the apostate church, and the seven letters to the seven churches in the Revelation. He warned that last church, and what did he tell them? Remember what I said? Chapter 3, verse 19, Revelation. What does it say, Nathan? You want me to look it up, don't you? Well, I'm going to tell you something. My revelation falls out of my Bible. It's all apart. Look at it. It's terrible. <laughs> All right, let me see what it says. <laughs> yeah. This is Jesus' words. As many as I love, and that's the word phileo, I have a brotherly affection for. I rebuke, right? What's that word rebuke mean? Here in the Greek text, it means I'm going to point out your errors or your faults. And, and I chasten. What does that chasten mean? I'm going to punish you. So as many as I love, I'm going to point out your errors. And how does he do that? Through the word of God. And then I'm going to chase you. I'm going to punish you. Therefore, be zealous and repent. So he's saying, now, let this move you passionately, emotionally, spiritually, to repent and change your life. Now, that's the only reason why I keep bringing this stuff up. Somebody said, why do you, why do you, do, why do you harp on this? Why do you, why do you bring up the negative? Because I don't want to see anybody left behind. I want to stir you up. I want to scare you so you don't want to be left behind. But I want to tell you, if you're not in obedience to God on those very basic things that he commands us to do, why would you expect that he's going to rapture you? The rapture and salvation are not synonymous. Every Christian is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Not every Christian is raptured. Now, anybody that told you that lied to you. That's not the Bible. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible tells me there is an innumerable number of Gentiles of every tribe, nation, people, and tongue who go through the tribulation period. Now, wait a minute, how can that be? Because in the tribulation period, the 70th seven of Daniel begins where God is working primarily upon the Jew, and the Gentile church is over. The fullness of the Gentiles is done. The Gentile church is gone. How could that possibly be? If God is working to save Jews now and not Gentiles, how could that be? They went into the tribulation saved, is my suggestion, but not completely surrendered. One disciple was a traitor and hung himself. Eleven were martyred, or ten, excuse me, ten were martyred. One died of natural causes. You have to ask yourself, why? 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 Why the disparity? We discover that John risked his life by staying at the cross with Jesus and the women, while the others ran for their life. I'm going to preserve my life here no matter what, rather than living for Jesus, no matter what the cost. John said, no, it's not about my life, it's about his. And so John was proven faithful at the cross. The others had to be proven faithful in martyrdom. Now, it wasn't their faith. It was the faith that God had given them. But I want to suggest to you that God shows everyone the measure of saving faith he's given them before they leave here. What did he say? I couldn't hear him. Oh, man. to say Yeah. I just said that. 
Absolutely he did. Absolutely. And what's God going to do with these tribulation saints? He's going to use them to be a witness. Now, I just want to tell you, I have a preference. I, 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 want, to, I want my life to be the witness now and not then. Okay? I just want a seat in the balcony, and I don't even want to see what's going on down here. Right? Read again. Finish the text. Where are we? Daniel 6. Thank you. And the king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions. Them, their children, and their wives, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. No, again, I don't think it was all these satraps and all, but it was the leaders. Abiram, Nathan, and Dathan, who were they? Abiram, Nathan, and Dathan. You know who they were. Come on, you know who they were. All right, these were the rebel rousers. These, these, these were the men in Israel who came against Moses and Aaron, saying, Moses, you take too much upon yourself. Moses, who do you think you are? Who, you think you're God? We hear from Jesus, too. We hear from God, too, you know. Mm. Everybody wants to be a priest unto themselves, right? And especially in today's, everybody's a prophet. Get on YouTube. <laughs> That's crazy. And so Moses, the humblest man that ever lived, he said, he said, look, 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 look. Everybody who's on the Lord's side, come on over here with Aaron and I. Everybody who's following the son, Abiram, Nathan, you go over there. 250 princes of renown in Israel. You would never, you would never have caused anyone in Israel to believe they were anything other than princes of renown. And Moses said, God, you decide. And what did God do? He opened up the earth and he swallowed up all of them and their wives and their little ones. And there's only one thing he preserved. What was that? The censers. Every one of them, he said, take a golden censer, put incense in it, which represents a prayer unto God, and, and, and offer them to God. God saved the censers because they were consecrated, but their, men, their lives weren't. The church today wants to be cool, not consecrated. The church today wants to be hip and holy, not hip and not holy. Is that not true? Oh, everybody loves the cool and the hip church. They don't want the consecrated and the holy church. Be why? Because it's an obstacle to their comfort. Daniel was an obstacle to their comfort, to their compromise, to their appeasement, to their carnality. And so should you be, beloved, in a loving way. I try to be. Jake was visiting with Daniel in the hospital. Everybody knows who Jake is, right? Jake's a nurse, and so the nurse was having trouble. And he said, hey, I'll do that. You know, I stick people all the time. And I said, I couldn't do that, but I stick people all the time with the word of God. <laughs> he looked and said, yeah, you do. <laughs> uh, finish the text, okay. <laughs> So he threw them in. They got destroyed by the lines, the very line. Isn't that amazing? That's exactly what Satan is doing. He gets these people to compromise and appease him and, and, and do his bidding. And then eventually he turns on them and destroys them. That's all he is. Delilah and Samson. Samson and Delilah thought he could dance with this, this daughter of the devil without harming himself. Satan's Desire is to destroy every human being, period. Why? Because he created the image of God and God loves every one of them. The general love of God is spread to all mankind. But aren't we glad for that specific love of God and grace? Oh, thank you, Jesus, for sovereign grace. But make no mistake, the very men who thought they were going to entrap Daniel and Daniel would be eaten by the lion, Satan turned on them and destroyed them. That's what Satan is going to do with this crazy socialist, Marxist revolution that's going on in our country today. Stay close to Jesus. You got nothing to worry about. Then King Darius wrote another proclamation. Okay, good king. <laughs> <laughs> to all peoples, nations, languages who dwell upon all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. They don't now, do they? Do men fear and tremble before the God of Daniel? <laughs> oh, but they're going too soon. They're going to hide themselves in the cliffs of the rocks. 
because of the wrath of God that's going to be poured out upon this world. They may not fear him now, oh, but they will. Every knee will bow. Every knee will confess that Jesus is Lord. After that, some he will be Savior, others he will be Judge. For he is the living God, the one true God, steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one that shall not be destroyed. His dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on the earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? Has he delivered you from the power of the lions? Yes, he has. Listen to me. The greatest miracle that Christ has performed that you're aware of is your salvation. Every salvation is a miracle. The transformed life, it's a miracle. It's by the power of God. You would never come to God. At least he draw you. He's, he transforms our life. He changes our life. And so, so this Daniel, not that Daniel, but this Daniel, <laughs> prospered in the realm of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Magrat, the ragmag, the chief of the counselors. That's where the... the cult of Daniel, in a, in a positive sense, the cult of Daniel, that's where these magi came from, out of that understanding that Daniel brought in Babylon, when the magi came from the east to worship the Christ child. They got that understanding from Daniel. He was an influencer. Wasn't he? Did he influence all of the king? No, no. But he influenced some of the kingdom. And listen, every one of us, we're called to be influencers. If God uses you to transform one life, it's all worth it, isn't it? But he wants to use you to transform more than one. Not just your life, but a lot of other folks as well. Be bold, beloved. Time's running out. And our service is over. But very soon, this church age is going to be over. The fullness of the Gentiles, when it ends... God will no longer be working predominantly among the Gentile world, but once again, the 70th 7th of Daniel, that last chapter, we'll get to that when we get into chapter 9, will we'll begin to tick off, and the last seven years of human history in this world, in this age, as we know it, will begin. And it's a very short seven years. Thank God it's a short seven years. But for those who have to endure it, it won't seem short at all. It'll seem like an eternity. Hmm? Questions, comments? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That Daniel, the one of the captivities of Judah, you know. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Putting Jesus over every other ism and religion out there. We make no excuses for that, do we? No apologies. The exclusivity of Christ is clear. But that way is open to anyone who would believe. Darius became a believer. Hmm. Through the influence of one man. How many people become believers through your influence? Through your godliness. Through your complete surrender to God. No matter what. Let's pray.